student experience to me is is the single most important thing that we do. It is our currency, not only for international, but also for domestic students. G'day and welcome to the Global Horizons podcast. I'm Rob Milicki coming today from Garrigal Land in Sydney. Thanks for your company. And my guest today is Kent Anderson, very well-known figure in Australian international education and a really good guy as well. He's currently Deputy Vice-Chancellor of Global Education and Partnerships at the University of Newcastle. I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Kent, thanks for joining me on Global Horizons. Thanks, Rob. And it's fantastic to be here. Just, I'm on a Wabakal country, but I woke up this morning, looked out my window and there was a pot of whales going by. And, you know, just made me uh, thank the custodianship that the elders of the country where I am have been looking after the lands and the water where we are so that we can do that and thank them for allowing me to put my light footprints here for the time I'm here. I love that, mate. In fact, and here here on Garrigal land, I look out over the Garrigal National Park. So that is like the remaining (laughs) biggest chunk of land here in Sydney that's that's sort of uh, traditional lands as well. So um, I think we're both very fortunate. I wanted to something start on something that's not international ed, but obviously links into where you are right now. Because when you were younger, you went on a heck of an adventure uh, cycling across North America. But then you also did a student exchange program in Japan. So before we get in, I'd love to hear some details, but before we do... Where did your sense of adventure come from, Kent? Yeah. So actually, I'll connect both of those and I'll connect them to international. But can I, I bring up with the origin story if it goes that way? So I grew up in Alaska, small town in Alaska. I didn't have a passport. No one in my family had a passport. No one in my family spoke anything but English. We were monolingual English speakers. And... You know, I think my great grandmother, one of my great grandmothers, had had Swedish, but other than that, you know, it's just uh, very, very. But strangely, everyone in my family has always moved or or been peripatetic, and so now my older sister lives in Barcelona, my younger sister lives outside Boston, my parents go between outside Victoria, Canada, and and California, and I'm in Australia but I spend most of the time on airplanes, to be honest. So there is a a bit of not having that international bit, but a bit of, you know, moving around. And you can trace back both of my my family trees and you'll see people have have moved a lot. So when I went to uni, I actually went to uni to be a ski racer, but I thought, Bosch, I better study something as well. And I tried to get into the Russian program, because at that time it was the Cold War and most of the Russian experts were coming out of this small place I went to uh, went to uni. So I signed up for Russian and then literally 12 hours before the first class, my advisor called up and said, Kent, you've got down that you want to do a degree in economics and a degree in politics and you want to study Russian. Well, you know, it's the Cold War and you can't do that, mate. So I was like, well, what other languages do you got? And he was like, mate, we got 27 languages. What do you want? And I said, I don't know, something hard. So I ended up on a whim picking Japanese and knowing nothing about Japan. And and to be honest, not being very interested in Japan, but just doing it as as a language and advantageous. Um, But then my third year ended up in Japan, as as many of the people who had listened to a Rob Malecki podcast would, would know through those student exchange. And I was blown away, just blew my mind. And I was like, I'd meet these cool people and these normal, rational people. And then I'd see groups do completely irrational actions. And I thought either everyone in this country is insane, or I've got a gap in my understanding. And I decided the likelihood of everyone being insane was probably less than the likelihood that I had a gap in my understanding. So that's when I really got interested in other cultures and other experiences. And so I came back and Anyway, uh, long story short, I spent three months hitchhiking in Japan. Uh, so I went in the middle of winter. So I went from the most farthern, uh, farthest northern point in Japan to the most farther southern point through every prefecture hitchhiking. And I actually kept a diary of every single ride I got, about 360 rides. And could tell lots of stories on those. But when I got back 
to the United States, I realized because I grew up in Alaska, I knew nothing about the United States. And so that got me thinking. So when I graduated, I decided I need to figure out America in kind of a Jack Kerouac kind of sense. And so I got my push bike and I started in Boston and I ended up in San Francisco. And, you know, I had a couple of friends who were like, oh, do you want me to come along? I'm like, no. I was like, no, this is going to be a solo adventure. I wanted to have self discover America myself. I didn't want that prejudiced by other people's impressions. And I also wanted to spend some own time in my head. So, so that's what I did. And that's how I did it. The, the one other interesting bit of that is just before I, I started the trip, I got a glandular fever. And so I had to postpone it for two weeks. So I did the first two weeks with glandular fever, uh, which was which was a bit tough. And then by the time I finished it, I was down to, I won't tell you what I weigh now, but I was down to about, you know, 60 kilos. And it was, but, but a, a great trip. I think I did discover America in a way it was less exciting than I was hoping for. What I think is fascinating about that story is how it all basically came from this this arbitrary moment, right? Where you're just like, oh, Japanese, sounds hard. I'll, <laughs> I'll do that. And then suddenly you're, you know, you're hitchhiking across Japan and cycle touring across, across North America. Between, between those, t- the two countries, what were, what were the most striking differences between, you know, going end to end in Japan and coast to coast yeah. in, in North America? The east to west coast of America To be honest, I was expecting this kind of epiphany of this is what Americana is, you know, either a, you know, Bob Dylan Route 66 or, you know, a Jack Kerouac on the road or, you know, one of those great, you know, American road trip stories that comes with all of a sudden, you know, even Thelma and Louise, a a big meaning. And what I got to the end, I was actually just found it really boring. Boring in the sense that I had a very good taxonomy of the size of a town based upon, you know, if they had a 7-Eleven and a video rental shop or whatever. But because of American culture and because I had grown up there, everything was in many ways predictable. Now, contrast that with Japan, where even the commonplace was unpredictable for me in Japan because I didn't have that reference point. So some things that I'm sure Japanese people wouldn't find very interested at all. I found fascinating, you know, the thing like on highways, the roadside convenience stores, I just found, you know, really, really interesting. So I think that inquisitive nature was sparked in more so in Japan than, than the United States. I'm glad I did the United States. And as a physical activity, it was great. But as a kind of you know, sparking of something I didn't know about, it was in some ways disappointing. And then after that, after you'd sort of gone through your, your fir- the first part of your tertiary education, you ended up in yet another country, the UK, to do further studies. Tell me about, tell me about that. Yeah, and it's not a direct route. There's a couple of stops, but indeed I, I do end up in the UK. It was, I didn't like the UK as an environment and, and sorry to all the the. English and British friends on on the thing. It was really dark. It was really wet. I didn't, you know, I I had some friends, but I didn't make a lot of great friends when I was there. It was almost transactional. And and I should mention, you know, I was doing my postdoc in Oxford and, you know, so that's, that's kind of neat and cool in in some ways, but it's also a, a bit strange in others. But what I got from England was most of my life had been comparing the United States to Japan. And adding England to that, and I say England more so than Britain, it allowed me to triangulate it. Because when you're looking at US Japan, it's always Japan that's weird. And you're always explaining why Japan is so odd. But as soon as you add a a third point to it, in this case, England, or, or more broadly, the UK, you can actually see the outlier is the United States. And because I was grown, I grew up in the United States in Alaska, that was kind of like the norm and everything that wasn't the United States was odd. But then seeing more of the world, you realize it's the opposite. It's the inverse of that, where the United States is is really quite quirky and, and very much an outlier. So that was the great educational moment of being in the UK. And so from there, you've, you've started an academic career. Well, I mean, we're, we're dusting over highlights here, right? But, but eventually, you, you've sort of made the shift from academia, you know, legal academia, into, into international 
How, how did that happen for you? I will go back very briefly, just a couple of steps. Please. So I came out of an undergraduate and then I worked for an airline doing marketing and doing joint ventures, particularly with Japan. And then I went to graduate school and then I was a commercial lawyer in Hawaii. And then I did the, the, the postdoc and then by accident, I was supposed to go back to my law firm, but by accident, I, I got an opportunity to go be a professor at Hokkaido University in Japan. Um, and so, and then that then led me to Australia through ANU, uh, Australian National University. So I'm in ANU and I'm kind of a normal academic doing normal academic -y things. And I really enjoyed it. And I would say when I first started off, I was kind of a heavy researcher. And then I moved into this phase after I got my chair where I was, at, I was also teaching a lot. And then there was this moment where there was a, a leadership vacuum at my bit of the university and my colleagues dobbed me in and I said, okay, well, I'll be a dean for two years just to kind of as collegial serve, you know, the community good. And I did it for two years and one, I enjoyed it. Two, I found out I wasn't completely crap at it. And I also saw, you know, so what's driving me? I always, what was always driving me is how to have impact. And I saw that in many ways I could have a bigger impact by facilitating others to be wonderful. So I didn't have to be wonderful in myself. I just had to help others be wonderful. And that's what, that's what got me into university administration. In many ways, that's what, that's what has kept me in university administration is how to help others have greater impact. I once heard a VC that I know who was a very good scientist when he was a, a functioning, sorry, functioning academic, but, you know, an active academic, say something similar. And he, you know, he said, God, like I kind of got into a similar sort of route. And I realized that the administration side was fascinating because if I could make a policy, you know, that little bit better, if I could improve some sort of administrative function just that much, and I could add 1%, you know, to the workloads of, or, you know, to the to, to productivity of a thousand people, well, that ended up adding up to a lot more than the hundred percent that I could put in as an academic. And I thought that was an, an amazing way of, of scalability, you know, looking at scalability. And, and that was certainly a fascinating thing for me to hear as a fairly junior staff member. I went, oh, okay, now I start to see why this is so important. I would very much agree with that story. Also, I get really frustrated when I see things that are annoying and don't work. I, inefficiency drives me up a wall. And rather than whine about it, I really like to be able to do things about it. And, and so that's part of it. Can you tell another slightly different story, which is I became Pro Vice Chancellor International at University of Adelaide. And I was working with a guy named Glenn Stafford, Dr. Glenn Stafford, and he, Glenn had just finished his PhD. And we're standing in my office one day, which overlooked this quadrangle. And, and we're looking out the window. I said, Glenn, this is a giant Petri dish. We can go have impact. What do you want to try? You know, nowadays, you would probably tell that story with more of an entrepreneurial uh, analogy. But the idea was, you know, someone's given us the keys. Boy, it, that probably wasn't a good idea. But we can actually go try to do some things and, and, and try to affect change. I also think, you know, this whole professional academic divide, I think, is very artificial. But I do think I brought, as someone who had, you know, been a frontline academic, an understanding of some of the day-to-day -day frustrations. And I, I, I hope I still carry some of that knowledge and definitely some of that normative value about how do we make life better for particularly frontline staff and because that will lead to a better student experience. And in the end, from that student perspective, that's what, that's what we want. I think it's a tremendous advantage to have gone from sort of the academic side into administration. What about, what advice would you have for somebody who perhaps has started on the other side? You know, someone who started in international, who really wants to get a better understanding of day-to-day -day life and ins and outs of, you know, life over in, in the faculties. Do you have some specific advice for someone like that? I don't like to prescribe and I don't like to give, you know, you should do this. I don't like shoulds because I think everyone's different and everyone has, has different things. But some of the things that are in my mind, I think having been in an airline doing marketing, I think having been a commercial lawyer, I think having been basically a full-time researcher and then kind of a 40, 40, 20 academic, 
each one of those helped me to do the administrative bit better and, and in different sectors, you know, so the airline industry is deregulating, you know, the kind of a bog standard law environment. So part of what I would be telling people in international ed is, you know, I'm curbing my natural language here a little bit, but get the F out of <laughs> international ed and go do something else and, and then come back and, and bring those outside experiences in. So that's one thing I'd say. Another thing I'd say is, you know, I think graduate studies are really important to under. So if you're at the point where you've done an undergraduate and you find yourself in international education, I'd always be encouraging people to think about graduate studies, whether that be, you know, you know, an MPhil kind of research path or whether it be an MBA or something. I just think the four year or the three or four year undergraduate is, is kind of a very contained box. And so using a bit of the time when you've got a bit more time and space when you're in your twenties or early thirties, using that to get a bit more education, I think makes you more empathetic to one of our chief missions being students, but it also makes you much more understanding of the other chief mission, you know, being research and how that fits uh, part of the puzzle in higher education. I know I think of international education much broader than higher education, but but in higher education. Yeah, definitely. I think you're taking that opportunity when you're in your 20s, for sure, if you eventually go on and have family and kids and the like, it's such a luxury when you're early in your career to have that extra time, that extra capacity to go and study something that you really care about or that you're interested in. And all of that stuff is good, right? I think down, downstream in your career, it doesn't really matter what that is. It could be psychology or anything. But work your day job and then and, and then do something else that, that, that you're really interested in is, is, is definitely an advantage. So this is a podcast, so you can't see me vigorously nodding in agreement to that yeah. statement. I don't, to be honest, I really don't care what people have studied. I care that they've gone out because they want they had a hunger for new knowledge and they had the kind of inquisitive nature to to pursue that. Absolutely. Now you so we've, we've mentioned ANU, we've mentioned Uni of Adelaide, but you've obviously been a couple of other institutions as well, UWA, now you're at Newcastle, and all in, you know, through senior roles. So there's a lot of transition that goes between move, when, you, when you move between institutions and every institution has its own, its own nature. What have you, what have you, or what advice would you have for people about changing institutions? Is there something that you've learned as you've gone along where you're like, I, I now know that to get up to speed in an institution, to try and get on board, find the right stakeholders, get on board with them, et cetera, here are a few things that I, I would do if I'm doing it another time. Yeah, what an interesting question. So I'm going to string together a couple of thoughts here. The first one is, as you say, I'm at my fourth Australian university over 25 years, and you know, three of them group of eight and, and one of them not group of eight. The 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 choice to be out of a group of eight was a conscious one. I was kind of like, I'd seen it from that side of the world and I wanted to see it from a different side of the world. The first thing I'd say, and again, I am going to slip into my, my own vernacular here, but more or less all Australian universities are the same. It's just, they've got 10% of shit distributed in different places. So, so the question as you come in is finding where the 10% of shit is because it's there. I mean, I had, I, again, at least my four data points, and the way my mind works, and I'm going to confess a vulnerability on this, but let's do the upside first. The way my mind works is I love that period of the beginning where you're trying to figure out how things go together and you're trying to find where the shit is and you're trying to find out who the allies are and you're trying not to step on the landmines or, you know, in the old faulty tower ways, you know, you know, don't mention the war, you know, you're trying to figure all of that out. I find that really, really exciting and, and energizing. And then the next phase where you're like, okay, I, I've kind of got this enough figured out. Now we're, let's try to put together what is the plan that works for this specific institution at this specific time. I love that bit too. And then the next phase, which is, okay, let's go get everyone to sign on to this. Let's sell it. Let's get it agreed. I love that phase too. My great weakness is the next bit I don't like, which is let's just keep driving the same thing forever and ever. And, and so I think it is a weakness of mine that I would find it hard 
doing the same thing 10 years from, from when I began. So I need to constantly kind of find those new, new environments. To the extent I was giving advice, I would, one of the things I would say is if you have what I've just described as my own behavior in you, if you, let's call it peripatetic nature, I still think you need to anchor it on at least one deep experience. So I did 11 years at ANU. You can't just always be floating on the top. You need some place where you go deep. So you can understand that and understand that perspective. I don't know if it's five years or if it's 11 years or if it's 20 years. I, I don't know what the magic number is, but I would be encouraging people coming through to, to make sure they have one really solid anchor rather than just always be running from the grass being green on one side to the next side to the next side. Okay, so it's interesting talking about universities. Where we first came into contact, though, was as part of the development of the new Colombo plan. I'm very grateful to you. I've said this, I say this every public forum I have that if it weren't for Kent Anderson, I wouldn't have been involved in establishing or helping to establish the new Colombo plan, which has been one of the best things, most enjoyable and, and professionally satisfying things that I've been involved in. So thank you again, Kent. But, but so this was a, a project we were setting up for Australian government. And then after that, so Julie Bishop, after that, you have also worked as a senior advisor to the education minister, federal education minister, Dan Tien. So that's, a, that's another level of, of policy, I guess. So what would, you, what would you say are the sort of similarities and differences between working within an institution policy inside an institution and policy at a government level? So the first thing I'd say is, you know, all the way going back to, to the story I told about my undergraduate years, I had an interest in policy. You know, I did a degree in economics. I did a degree in, in, in political science. You know, I was relatively politically active and, you know, in the sense that I pass out things at the sausage sizzle and stuff like that. So I was always interested in, in public policy in an Australian context, because I am a migrant, you know, I took citizenship in 2004, 2003, 2004, but I still felt I didn't have a voice because I was a migrant and I, and it wasn't my place to have a comment on public policy because who am I? I'm just the, the new guy on the block. And then in 2008, I can tell the story, but I, I was invited to the 2020 summit, Australia 2020 summit. I was very proud to be there and it made me feel very Australian and it made me feel comfortable with voicing my opinion in a broader forum. So following on from that, I think I was, I remained active in a periphery, the way stakeholders active stakeholders can be. So you talk about the new Colombo plan, but I think, you know, in total, I've probably been on 10 or 15 different committees or policies around government. And, you know, as president of the Japanese Studies Association and president of the Asian Studies Association and a whole bunch of those kind of periphery policy things where you're trying to influence policy. So I kind of thought I got this policy thing. I'm like, I've got this educational background. I've got this limited exposure. You know, I had a couple of ministers and politicians on my mobile phone I could call up. And then Dan, so Dan, the election happens. They weren't expecting to win. I get a phone call, says, Kent, you and I, Dan and I went back and forth, to be honest, about four calls over a number of hours, over a number of weeks, because it was not a good career choice for me, right? If you're in academia, going to work for uh, the coalition is not really a career winner. And he's taking a big risk as well, you know why hire an academic? You know, this is just insane. So we had to work through that. But in the end, why I did it is because I do, I was interested in in, in policy and interested in, in what it could be. So I plopped down, plop in, in mid-2019 into the role. And it was thrilling to be a fresher again, to be a freshman again, to know absolutely nothing, be absolutely terrified at being trying to fake it like you knew where you were doing. It was exhausting and terrifying. So from personal development, it, it, was, it was great. But what my conclusion after having done it for two years, and I stayed on for a transition with, with the next minister as well, uh, my conclusion is I knew absolute fucking nothing about policy 
before I got in there. I think I do have a better understanding of it now. I think what I was doing beforehand, it, it was contributing. It does cr- contribute in a very, very important way, but it's only just one layer of a very complex uh, equation. How complex is it? So, Because most people, I mean, I've seen a little bit behind the curtain as part of that new Colombo plan development process, but I haven't really seen behind the curtain. How complex is it back there? Think about the most complex thing you've ever thought about, and it's beyond that. So we ended up taking a major piece of legislation through the process. And and I can also talk about COVID and and what happened during that. But we took a major piece of legislation through the process. And, you know, the bit that I'm good at, which is being an academic and thinking about policy and thinking about what you want to achieve and thinking about that's only one bit. And to be honest, a very small bit of the puzzle. Then in, in our big piece of policy, there's actually, there's lots of people in the room, but there's three core players. So, so I'm the one who's the academic who's thinking about that. We've got a public servant who is, who's been in the public service for 30, 40 years, who just without his expertise of how those intricacies worked, we wouldn't have got there. And then I had a minister who was understood the political process I thought I knew it, but I knew nothing. And watching him was just, it was, it was just like, you know, if you're an amateur skier and you watch a professional skier, you're an am. it was just such a whole nother level of his understanding. And you needed all three of those pieces to come together in order to do it. If you don't have one of those pieces and you're trying to do big reform, it's, it's not possible. And so that was the big complexity or, or big learning for me. Also, you know, I only had one piece of the pie. There's no way I could have got there without those other two pieces. So shifting back to Australian International Ed, you're now at Uni of Newcastle. What, what are you most excited about in, in your portfolio? And that, that could be specifically at the university or, or more broadly in Australian, for, for Australian international education more, more generally. I've got two things that I'm really worried about. Um, The first thing I'm really worried about is our broader Australian communities understanding and appreciation of international education. And we sold the broader community for 20 years. We're really important because we make lots of money. And COVID hit and we had no friends because we had been telling them we're just in it for the money. So I worry in our rebound, we're not only falling back on old unconstructive narratives, we're actually in some ways doubling down on that. Mm -hmm. And some of the very, very aggressive commercial behavior that we're seeing right now, in the short term is fine, but in the medium to long term is actually going to alienate a lot of the Australian public. So, So that's my number one concern. And it's interesting because it was a pre-COVID concern, but I'm actually more worried about it post-COVID. The other one I worry about is student experience to me is is the single most important thing that we do. It is our currency, not only for international, but also for domestic students. I do worry that in our digitally enabled, modern, high-tech educational environment, a lot of what, what you and I where the great bits of education have been have been lost or or I don't think they're lost. I think they're optional and not everyone is opting into them. And so I really would like to come back to student experience and how we in, ensure how that's the primacy of everything that we do. And, you know, there's lots of examples and you know, in a podcast, I don't want to name names, but, you know, there's one very prominent example in Australia of a, of a university and a school, which is making tons of money hands over fists which one, I think, alienates the community. But I also think in many ways, because that is the driver, it does not deliver a good educational experience for those students. And that makes a great vulnerability. So those are my two worries. I'll pause there, and but you can lead me into the positives if you want. I agree. I I spend a lot of time in the digital landscape, whether it's social media, new AI technology, these sorts of things. And, And to me, you know, Things like ChatGPT, which which is really current uh, at time of recording, is going to put so much content out there. It, it changes 
it changes the equation somewhat. Like content by itself is not is is not the thing anymore. It's about trust. Who do you trust for your information? So I think unis are well placed in that sense. But then beyond that is 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 the user experience, just like you say, like the student experience online is the user experience. Is how do we create experiences that are that are remarkable, that actually make people want to engage? And, and those organizations that manage to create incredible experiences or experiences where you can add on lots of things, they will thrive. And the ones that don't are, are going to really struggle in, in the years ahead. So let me use that as my springboard to my optimism. Yeah. So it's about experiences that are amazing. It's about experiences that transform who we are as people, right? You know, that's a cliche, but it's, it's cliche because it's true. My time in Japan, you know, as a 20 year old, fundamentally changed who I am and where I was going in all of that. So my optimism is, how do we get more of our Australian community? How do we facilitate them to have those amazing experiences? And going back to the new Colombo plan, but, you know, I've spent a lot of time thinking about the instrumentality, the, po- the, the policy way you facilitate that to happen. And so I am now more convinced that short term programs that are put together in a very constructed, conscious way can have as much, if not more impact than long, unconstructed programs. I think there's still a role for unconstructed programs, but I get really excited about that. And I sit down with a group of students who are just coming back or more often I meet with our students who are overseas and they're just, their minds are just boom, they're just exploding. And, you know, again, I was that 20 year old kid. So I understand what that feels like. I'm really excited about that. And, you know, going back to University of Newcastle, we're pretty good at this. You know, we probably would be definitely in the top 10 historically. Yeah, the the goal I've set for for ours is to be in the top three for a percentage of undergraduate students that that have an international experience. And we're going to be there. We're very close. We're, we're going to achieve that. But I also have done that in an environment where, you know, 25% of our students are in the lowest social economic um, category. We have the largest number of Indigenous students in the country. We, you know, first and family, everyone's got a lot of first and family, but, you know, we are serving a demographic that is very different than my 20 years in the group of eight, where many of those students, as a matter of fact, we used to target them. You've had an international experience growing up. We'll just write on the back of that. Whereas Newcastle is a different equation. And yet we're achieving top three in the country. That to me is more satisfying than almost anything else. It's been awesome chatting, Ken. I'm really grateful for you taking the time to to chat with us here on Global Horizons. My guest today has been Kent Anderson, Deputy Vice Chancellor, Global Engagement and Partnerships at the University of Newcastle. Really looking forward to next time we catch up in, in person, Kent, and thanks again for joining us. Thanks. Thanks, Rob. And I do hope someone gets this far into it. And I do hope they, they, they get to hear that, you know, Rob Malecki really has been a pioneer in the field and he has changed our system for the better. And I can tell specific stories about how he influenced the minister in the, in the settings. The Global Horizons podcast is brought to you by The Global Society, Australia's learning abroad support company. For about 10 years, The Global Society has been supporting Australian learning abroad teams with technology, training, consulting, strategy, marketing, you name it. We all know that learning abroad is time consuming and complex. So if your team could use a little bit of extra support, reach out to The Global Society, globalsociety.com. Today's episode was recorded on Garigal land in Sydney, and we pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. Thank you. See you next time.